This Week on Waterways, Eagles in South Florida, and Catch and Release Techniques. On the backs of coins, on our printed money, on the presidential seal, at the tops of flagpoles flies a regal bird, the bald eagle. It is a symbol of strength and ferocity. Though the real bird might not have all the qualities we admire, it sometimes scavenges at dumps and on roadkill. It is still a very impressive bird of prey. It stands three feet tall and has a wingspan of almost seven feet. It takes larger prey than any other raptor. It is powerful enough to pluck spoonbills, herons, and good-sized game fish out of the water. If you see an eagle outdoors or in the classroom, it's difficult to ignore. Like these kids, you want to get closer. When Greta Mealy isn't showing the eagle to classes, she and her husband Brian do get closer, a lot closer. Brian and Greta Mealy study eagles in the Florida Bay region of Everglades National Park. During the last 40 years, the bald eagle has come back from near extinction. Today, there are more bald eagles in Florida than in any other state in the lower 48, and Everglades National Park has one of the densest populations in the state. Uh, one of the things like with other birds, every bird from different areas has different movement patterns. One of the movement patterns we do not understand is the ones that's down here in Florida Bay. We probably have at one time or the other 25 territories. That 25 territories averages into about 50 adults. If you have the chicks and half those nests even produce two chicks, uh, you're talking about anywhere from you know, 75 to 100 eagle, eagles in South Florida. While the recovery of the bald eagle is a success story, they can still teach us about our environment. Because eagles sit at the top of the food chain, they are great indicators of problems like pollution. If there is too much mercury or pesticide in the environment, it will show up strongly in the eagle. Biologists at Everglades National Park located nests through aerial surveys. They pass the locations on to Brian and Greta. Brian must time his visits to these nests very carefully. If he comes too early, the birds will not be big enough for the satellite tags. If he comes too late, the eagle fledglings are large enough to fly away. Seen with the eagles way up inside the nest, way in the back there. He's a little curious. He might go. He might go. Okay. I'm gonna make my move, okay? Be really tired now. The parents keep well clear of people, but they don't abandon the chick. They'll pass overhead to keep an eye on things while the mealies work. Though the chick is big, Brian and Greta handle it gently. He uses a few tricks to keep the bird calm. We're going to hood this bird right now. And the hood essentially is a falconer's technique. And what it does is it basically covers the eyes and really minimizes the stress on the bird. But he can't see, in human terms, he can't imagine. So this keeps him a lot calmer. 
To minimize the amount of time the bird is away from its parents, Brian and Greta work quickly. The first order of business is to attach a backpack. The backpack is a satellite transmitter that is very lightweight. It weighs basically nothing. And it's solar powered, that's basically the panel for the self energized as long as we have good sun out there. And it has to be designed in such a way that it's high enough that when the feathers are preened that it cannot cover the solar power. If it covers this window, we're going to lose the energy eventually, it won't be able to get a signal. The concept now is what we're going to do is when we do connect all these points, there can only be one point that they're all attached. And essentially what we're going to be looking at, everything is going to have one center piece. It's going to have about several stitches, but only in one place. The idea behind this is one that rots. It could rot in about five years. They all basically release at the same time, and it just falls off the bird. There's no entanglement. These transmitters will tell the mealies where the birds travel during the year. This might surprise most people, but we know amazingly little about the movements and migration of animals. We know where they show up each year, but nothing about where they are when they're not here. This is very important. If the birds suddenly show mercury or other poisons in their blood, we won't have the first clue about where they picked it up if we don't know where they spend their lives. The big question is, do they remain in South Florida? Do they just stay here, becoming what we call the endemic, a population that does not move out of this area? So we're hoping uh, within a five-year period to have a total of 25 transmitters on the eaglets, and then we cut it off. Each transmitter cost about $3,500, with satellite time costing about $2,000 per year, per transmitter. Funding for this project comes from the Bachelor Foundation of South Florida, who have supported many of Brian's field studies. When the Mealies have finished fitting the transmitter, they ban the bird. A band is like an ID bracelet that allows bird researchers around the nation to identify an individual bird from a distance. The first band, basically, this is a color marker for us. And it's one of the ones that we're hoping that with a pair of binoculars with a camera that we can photograph those legs and that number will be very visible to us. The bands nowadays are a little tougher to read and see. The mealies then start taking samples to test the bird's health. They swab the bird to look for infections. The last thing the mealies will do is take blood. DNA fingerprinting isn't just a technique from crime shows. Scientists will use DNA testing to figure out who is related to whom in the community of Florida Bay's eagles. Their toughest years is probably the first two years of their lives. Out of all the, the one eagle at, let's say, his life uh, for the first year, he has a 50% chance of survival usually. And then, the second year, it goes up to 75% of not surviving. And therefore, basically in two years, he has a 25% chance of making it. If he makes it through those two years, chances are he'll keep going then. Because then he has developed the skills of hunting, he has developed skills of avoiding other predators and how to find his food, either through chasing other prey or whatever, he or other birds. He is probably a lot more successful and prone to succeeding. During each year that the eagle survives, its color will change slightly. The second year, the head and the tail gain flecks of white. By the fourth, the eagles resemble someone with blonde hair who hasn't washed it for a while, and the beak is yellow. By the fifth year, the eagle looks like the archetypical bald eagle that is represented on coins, flags, and in the imagination of most Americans. Bald eagles that leave the nest today have an easier time than they did 50 years ago. For years, the eagle had been hunted and unwittingly poisoned. Well, chances are every population in, in the United States suffered from the DDT. And we're not only talking eagles, we're talking every species, which was a, quite a catastrophe. And luckily that through a cooperation of a lot of nonprofit organizations, universities, and the U.S. and the federal government, that they did identify DDT as a major problem. Uh, again, just to recall the problem there, DDT basically was affecting the calcium formation of the eggs 
of the eagles or any, any of the birds. And basically what happened was they would lay their eggs, they look nice and normal, the female would come up and try to brood, incubate them, and crush them. Thanks to conservation efforts, the eagle is an endangered species success story. In the 1960s, there were just over 500 breeding pairs in the lower 48 states. Today, there are 800 breeding pairs in Florida alone, and about 10,000 pairs in the lower 48. Even though it has recovered, the eagle is still of great value to scientists studying the environment. They are high up in that food web. They are the ones that consume everything underneath them, and therefore whatever's down here, they're probably bioaccumulating, meaning it's gathering in their body. So as a top predator, uh, if you're looking at mercury levels, uh, if you want to look for changes in the environment, if you want to see if something prey sources are disappearing because of environmental changes or catastrophes that are occurring that we cannot see, that's the first indicator. Okay, you gonna go to Beth Lomas? Yeah, there you go. Feeling good. One of the greatest values of the eagle is its charisma. Greta and Brian have found that people, and especially kids, easily relate to the bald eagle. Many people might be uninterested in mercury in the environment or the recovery of endangered species. But with a bald eagle on her arm, Greta has everyone's attention. If people can relate to something, especially everyday folks that do not deal with the environment, they have minimum contact or connection with the environment, it is so important that you use something that they know. And if it's a bald eagle, you use it. But at the same time, it doesn't take away that if you're going to be studying a small oak toad, who is probably a better indicator species for probably the Everglades than probably any other amphibian or bird or anything, um, you still maintain that study. But use the eagle to send the message. Use a strong, charismatic animal to send the message about the other problems about the other species, because he's the messenger. He's the ambassador. The prize picture, a 100-pound tarpon, a 10-foot sawfish. Anyone who considers themselves an experienced angler has one, a snapshot of their catch. Each picture is a moment in time, telling a story that is much bigger than the frame that contains it. A window in today's past, pictures are a plenty of huge fish carcasses hanging from boat boards, sawfish, tarpon, sharks, if one studies these historic photos, two things are clear. It's rare to see a fish that big in South Florida these days. And all the fish were killed back then. The picture today is much different. After witnessing the depletion of many fisheries and realizing the finiteness of their resource, many anglers in South Florida now practice a technique called catch and release. So the idea of catch and release fishing it doesn't really start when you're on the water. It starts long before you even start fishing when you're at the tackle store. If you get, if you fish with regular jigs and you know you're gonna be releasing some of the fish, you just take the, take the pliers and bend the barb down a little bit, such as that. Or you use a circle hook to where the, the hook is going to 80% of the time go into the jaw of the fish's mouth. Conservation ethics, which were once virtually non-existent in the world of sport fishing, have become more widespread. Unlike commercial fishermen, who catch fish specifically for consumption, sport fishermen catch fish for the pure excitement of the catch. Awesome. Just let it fall on the bottom. Many different type of uh, lippers, where you put the jaw of it on the lower lip of the fish, and you can secure the fish that way. And that way you're not grabbing the fish and holding it and wiping off its slime layer. And of course, there's uh, several different D hookers on the market to where when the, the hook is in the fish's mouth, you go ahead and grab the, the bend of the hook this way and the line on the bottom and pull it out. So there's, there's a whole there's a whole gamut of things you can do before you even begin fishing. 
in anticipation of that trophy fish that you want to release. The economics in sport fishing is tied to a guide's ability to find and catch fish. And a fish is too valuable to be caught only once. Nice. Controlled studies demonstrate that the survival of many species of marine fishes released after hook and line capture is high, validating current catch and release techniques and proving catch and release fishing as a valuable conservation tool. The basic idea of catch and release fishing is to minimize the impact from hooking and fighting the fish. There's a protective coating of slime on the fish that acts as a basic defense against disease and bacteria. Anglers must avoid removing the fish slime. Only touch the fish with wet hands if you do not have a release tool. The most, the most common way to mishandle fish is to, to grab them tight and try to subdue them against your body or with dry hands. And, and if you don't have the proper equipment like a de-hooker or a boga lipper, it's, it's fairly easy to do that. And I, I just like to try to tell the people you gotta do the best that you can do to release the fish. In Florida Bay, there are more than a dozen different species to target. And the bay has been considered a mecca for flats fishing for decades. Out here in Florida Bay, uh, people come to fish for a number of different sport fish, like redfish or snook, tarpon, permit or bonefish. But then there's the fun rod benders too, like the ladyfish, and the jacks, and the snapper, and uh, sharks. Oh my god, look at all these fish. Hold on, I'm sorry. There he is. Yeah, I know, I was like watching, I was like... When an angler hooks a fish, that fish should be brought in as quickly as possible to avoid increasing the fish's exhaustion. The more tired a fish is, the more susceptible the fish becomes to predation. Anglers should use circle hooks because the circle hooks rarely gut hooks a fish. Mostly, it hooks the jawbone of the fish. And in fact, anglers have less chance of losing a fish if the fish is hooked in the jaw with a circle hook. Anglers must make sure that the point of the hook is aligned with the shank. Offset circle hooks have a much higher chance of severely injuring the target species. Regardless of the species targeted, an appropriately sized non-offset circle hook fished properly will almost always outperform any other hook. Well sometimes you see if you have a fish and you're using just a regular J hook style uh, jig like this, that it's, it's deeply embedded and the best way to get it out isn't actually just to pull on it and jerk it out. The hook goes in one way, it will come out one way. And it, if you take some care and grab the bend of the, the hook by the pliers and pull directly backwards or rotate it out, it'll come out a lot better than if you just pull at the fish. When you're pulling at the fish, you're, you're actually uh, damaging their gill assemblages and you're doing uh, soft tissue damage on the inside of their mouth and uh, around their face sometimes. If you do not have a D-hooker, needle nose pliers or forceps can substitute. If you cannot see the hook upon initial examination of your catch, cut the leader as close to the hook as possible without removing the fish from the water. Leaving the fish in the water is best, but not always practical. Never boat a large fish. Leave big fish in the water for picture taking. When releasing a fish, release the fish head first into the water. A fish that has been overly stressed by the fight should be revived before release. To revive a fish, move it head first through the water so that water flows over the gills. Or the assumption that when I mean, you catch the fish, you throw it back in the water, it's going to live. Such a thing as mortality after the after the fact capture, hook and release mortality is kind of what's common with all. So you got to do everything in your in your capabilities to ensure that the thing survives. If it comes up and it's just going nuts and, and it gets off your line, you have no control over that. But if it looks tired and it's hooked well and you can drag it through the water more or 
not handle it a lot, not pull it out of the water and hold it for a picture. There's a lot of steps that you can do follow that ensure that the animal, or better ensure that the animal will survive. I mean, if you just drop it back in the water, its head sinks right into the mud. That's not a very good uh, indication, that, indication gonna that it's going to survive. <laughs> Pulling a fish out of the water after he's just had the fight of his life. He's run a marathon basically, and you pull him, you pull him out of his only source of catching his breath. It's going to be pretty tough on the fish, and so to yeah, keep it in, to keep it in the water as much as you possibly can, and just to let the fish catch back up, because if you if you really want to take a picture of it, you basically keep the fish in the water until the very last point. Keep it on the hook or on a boga grip or something and then get the camera ready, get everything ready, reach down, pull it out of the water, hold up, take a picture and put it right back in for as fast as you possibly can. There's one right there. While Florida Bay is often the destination for visiting anglers, the Keys Reef and the Blue Waters Beyond offer some of the Keys most diverse and most exciting fishing. Fish such as marlin, sailfish, tuna, and dolphin sometimes called mahi-mahi, are considered pelagic species found in the open ocean. While tuna and dolphin catches are almost always eaten, the marlin and sailfish anglers have long been practicing catch and release techniques. At the reef, where anglers can target anything from snappers to groupers to barracudas, successfully releasing healthy fish is a greater challenge. When reef fish are brought quickly to the surface from deep water, the gases in their swim bladder expand, causing it to rupture. Researchers at Moat Marine Laboratories found that snappers and groupers become functional within four days of a rupture and are healed within two weeks of the rupture. Anglers can aid deflation of the swim bladder by carefully puncturing the bladder or by gently squeezing it. And remember, never gaff a fish until you know it is of legal size. Everything they're reproducing out here is feeding something else. All the wading birds and the, and the like egrets. So if you take them out of the Spoon circle yeah. or the food web, then uh, those opportunities diminish for wading birds and for other predator and prey. Some old time fishing guides in the Keys are the most aware and conservationally minded people around they understand the need to create a sustainable resource so that they have job security and so that their children can fish these same waters. For those who are new to fishing the Keys, learning proper catch and release technique needs to be a part of their education. Years from now, as people look through the archives of fish caught off the Keys, they will see the same smiles and celebrations that are always present in fishing pictures. But hopefully, they won't have to reminisce about the days when they once caught the big ones.